Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's session on the fourth book of the Old Testament, that is Numbers. Before we could start with our class, can I request one of us to lead us in prayer? Loving Father, once again, Lord, we thank you. Lord, we praise you, Master, for this beautiful day, Lord. Lord, as we gather together, Lord, to know more about you, your word, Lord, I especially pray for the pastors, Lord, as he is leading us, Lord. Holy Spirit, Lord, I ask you, bless her, Lord, anoint with your power, so the Lord, whatever, Lord, you will speak, we will able to, Lord, not only listen, but, Lord, we will store it in our heart, Master. I thank you for everything, Lord. Once again, I commit everyone in thy hand. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, brother, for this wonderful prayer. Uh, so just a recap of what we are learning from last class. What did we learn from our last class? From the book of Leviticus, what did we learn? The different types of offerings. Yes. Seven fees. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Divya. So with this, we are moving on to the book of Numbers. I will just present, share the presentation with you all. And thank you. Yesterday, though the line got uh, disconnected, my side. <clears throat> you all were there. And thank you, John, for ending the class with a word of prayer. Okay, so the book of Numbers, the title, number itself in the English translation was the Latin word. It is called as numeric, which is translated from the Greek word arithmoi. So this, this is the fourth book in the law and which is named due to the fact that it records uh, uh, so many uh, 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 numberings or the census of the nation of Israel. And historically, the book begins with the book of uh, Exodus that leaves off. And the title number, we saw that it's from the Latin. And uh, uh, the first at the Mount Sinai, uh, we see the census being recorded. And a later part of this book, we see, again, they're taking the census at the uh, plains of Moab. So what was the need of census? Why should they take the census two times in this book. Can one of us let us know, a uh, share of your uh, thought on this? Why did they take the census again? Is it to allocate the different tribes uh, to, uh, as they're going to the promised land, to allocate the tribes? Yes. The tribes? Yeah. Yes. Anyone else? Why did they take the second time? Now, what the Vya said is for the first time, why did they take the second time? OK, well, the first time they took to allocate the tribe. OK, the second time they took the census, there was an incident that happened before the after the first census where the uh, with, uh, when uh, when uh, Moses sent out the 12 spies to uh, uh, to check on the land of Cana. And when they came back, there were 10 people who carried a bad report and two men, that is Joshua and Caleb. We will uh, see to it at the, when we are going through the outline. We will study in detail about them. They carried a good report. And you see the division among the people. And they, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the people started murmuring. And God was angry upon them because they murmured. And God didn't want any of that generation to enter the promised land. So they had to take the second census to make sure those who were there during that time are not alive when they're entering the promised land. So they had to take the census the second time. OK, so uh, that's why. Uh, and we see what we learn from each book, just an overview. Like in the book of Genesis, we see uh, this book uh, as the uh, book of creation where the man had fallen and it was ruined. And 
in the book of Exodus, we see the book of redemption. And in the book of Le Leviticus, we see it's a book of worship and fellowship. And uh, the book of Numbers is a book of service and walk. Uh, the book of Numbers was the fourth book in the Bible. And it is also the fourth book in the uh, Jewish law, that is the Torah. Uh, we see that uh, what does this book talks about? It carries the story of Israel after the exodus uh, had come out from slavery and how God has been leading the Israelites uh, 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 through the wilderness in, in uh, like how God brought them and how they camped around Mount Sinai and uh, how did they enter uh, the covenant, the promised land later. And uh, in this book, we also see uh, a lot of events that took place when they were camping at the wilderness. And in the book of Numbers, we see how the story goes from uh, uh, from each event to event and uh, what uh, what uh, what made uh, God angry and how, um, you know, uh, how they had to face the consequence of their action at the wilderness. And today we can also relate to them in our own life. So as we study, um, as we go through chapter by chapter, we will uh, we will see we will uh, unveil the events that took place. Though we don't have much time to go through in detail, but as much as possible, we will uh, go through these. So, if you all have your Bibles, please turn to uh, Numbers chapter one. So we will go through a few of the key events. But before we could go through the key events, we will go through our notes. Uh, we will go through our notes. We will look at the background. And we will talk about the background and the, uh, and the later. OK, so in our notes, we see the author is the Moses and the date and location. We see that this book was written in 1,406 uh, 1, yes, uh, BC. Probably the approximate date has been given. And the very purpose of this book was to prepare the people in the wilderness journey, to show the necessity for the nation to go through this painful process of uh, testing and uh, uh, the maturation. And we also see how God corrects his people when they disobey. We also see the failure of the uh, older generation to inherit the promised land because of their murmuring. And we also see how uh, God prepares them, the new generation prepares them, uh, and how they land up inheriting the promised land. We also see the four shadow of the sacrifice of Christ through the symbol such as the red eye and the uh, bronze serpent and later we also see the revealing of the attributes of God uh, that has been uh, seen the perseverance in the covenant keeping and there's a balance between his grace and his wrath uh, with this we will move on to the outline and outline as we move on to the outline we also cover the key events in this book so the first chapter of numbers that's what's saying that now the lord spoke to moses and you see uh, the organization of israel forming there and god instructs Moses how to take the census of all the congregation of the children of Israel by the families and by their father's house according to the number of names every male individually we see that in numbers chapter 1 verse 2 and we see how uh, you know God is a God of structure and God of you know is uh, very organized so he gives instruction like in the previous books okay in the previous books we see how God God gave a design to design the tabernacle, to design even the Ark of the Covenant, every inch, uh, every uh, width. You know, God gives the measurement. We also see even the priestly garment, how God uh, gave the design. 
yes purposefully we have not covered these two uh, uh, the a few of the events or few of the details in our previous class because these will be given as an assignment for each of the students so those uh, that we have not covered we will be uh, doing a detailed assignment on that okay so we'll come back to our lesson so how did uh, god organize uh, the tribes uh, god uh, made 12 tribes and how god organized in uh, setting the camp around the tabernacle for this i'll just display the picture so this is how god organized each and every tribe to be placed around the tabernacle uh, you see in middle we see the tabernacle can you see this image Yes, yes ma'am. Yes, okay, ma you're able to see that. Great. Okay, so in middle is the tabernacle. Around the tabernacle, we see the Levites are surrounded the tabernacle. And then we see the four, sorry, the 12 tribes been camped around them. So that uh, we we will start with the east. The entrance of the the entrance of the tabernacle is where Judah is the leader. We see Judah as per uh, uh, in chapter one. We see these are the names. Okay, uh, where it says uh, Judah, Nathan the son of Abinab, and uh, from the Isha, Nathan the son of Zerah. We are in uh, verse seven and eight. As you go. Lord is asking each and every who will be the leader, which will be the tribe and which side um, of the facing of the tabernacle, each one will be camped accordingly. Can you see uh, the image of a cross in this? Can we yes, see the image yes, of a yes. cross? So yes, in the beginning itself, God is designing a cross. In the beginning itself, we see the plan of Jesus. In every moment, you see the north, south, east, west, you see the plan of Jesus. So the leader of, of east uh, is Judah. So Judah will be faced at the first and then followed uh, next to Judah is Isachar and then Zebulun. This is as per the scripture, it has been arranged. And then uh, this is east. So then we have Reuben in the south. That is Reuben, Simeon and Gad towards the south. And, and then this side where Ibrahim is there, the tribe of Ibrahim. There we have Ibrahim will be on the west. Yes, so this is east, that is west. So west we have Ibrahim, Manasseh and Benjamin. And then we have Dan. Dan is in the north side. So Dan, Asher and Naphtali. So if you can see east, opposite to east, opposite to Judah is Ibrahim is the west. Then South is Reuben and opposite to south is Dan, which is the north side. And see, each of these tribe will have a flag to uh, to uh, to uh, wave the banner. They have a banner that they carried. Uh, so the flag of Judah, uh, there's a flag of Judah. So, uh, you know, uh, there's a uh, uh, there's a scholar called Kale Delitzer. Okay, he's a rabbinical scholar. So he says that the standard of Judah bore the figure of the lion and Reuben the likeness of a man and that of a Ephraim the figure of an ox and the Dan the figure of an eagle. So each one, each tribe had a figure and they were carrying the banner at, uh, uh, at the start of their camp, something like this. See, this is the east entrance where they camped. Sorry, the image is not very clear. It is a little blurred. This is how I could get an image with a flag on it. So we see the tabernacle 
the tent of the tabernacle and we see the flag before the camp there's a flag this is the flag of a Judah which has a lion symbol on it so each of them as they camped east west south and north north and south as they camped they had this symbol upon them for example we see here we see here, this is Judah facing east towards the tabernacle having the lion as their flag then we see Reuben towards the towards the south has a flag of a man and then we see here west west Ephraim has a flag of an ox and then here towards the south not south towards the north Dan tribe has a flag of an eagle so this is the north this is the south east and west you saw that Can we see that? Yes, yes, yes So how God relates, we have to see. In, in, in the book of Numbers, chapter 2, verse 2. Verse 2 to 10, we see who should be on the east side, who should be on the west side, who should be on the north, who should be on the south. Clearly, God is pl placing each and every tribe there. And in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 1, verse 10, can one of us please read Ezekiel, chapter 1, verse 10? Their faces looked like this. Each of the four had the face of a man, and on the right side, each had the face of a lion, and on the left, the face of an ox, each also had the face of an eagle. See, even uh, the vision of Ezekiel shows the same picture very clearly. So Ezekiel is facing towards the south. From the south, he is seeing where he can see the face of a man. And then towards his right, uh, towards his right, that is the east side. You see the face, the likeness of a lion. And then towards his west, where he sees the likeness or, uh, uh, of a bull. And towards the opposite side, that is the west side. You see uh, the likeness of an eagle. You see, everywhere God has been projecting this. And also in the book of Revelations, we see the same image carried there. Revelations chapter 4, verse 6 to 7. Can one of us please read? And before the throne, there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the center and around the throne, four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first creature was like a lion, and the second creature like a calf, and the third creature had a face like that of a man, and the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And Thank four you. and the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are of full eyes around and within. You see, again, the four features been uh, also uh, recorded in the book of Revelation, in the vision of John. And what does these four creatures denotes? They all relate to Christ. They all relate to Christ. We see, um, uh, we see lion as a lion of Judah, the king of Jews, and uh, we see in a man he is the son of man. Jesus was the son of man, and an ox. We see him untiringly labor. We see, uh, you know, uh, we uh, we see him untiringly labor when he was in. Uh, on this earth, Jesus went about, uh, uh, you know, preaching the good news to everyone and healing the sick and the depressed or comforting the, uh, the poor. He went about doing good untiringly. 
and then we see uh, uh, the face of an eagle in Jesus as uh, the son of God who came from heaven to be among us as son of man. So he was 100% God and he was 100% man, the prophetic figure. He was also a prophet among us. So we also see uh, you know uh, how this has been uh, related even in the gospel even in the gospel we see uh, Matthew records uh, Jesus as the king of uh, the Jews shows the kingship uh, shows uh, you know uh, the uh, the figure of uh, a lion lion of Judah the king of Jews the king uh, it also talks about the genealogy uh, the uh, the lineage from the David the Matthew portrays the gospel like that. And we see uh, Mark shows itself like an ox. Jesus who untiringly labored, going everywhere, healing the sick and preaching the gospel untiringly. And then we see Luke portraying Jesus as the man who, who, who labored. Uh, untiring as a man and also Luke records the genealogy uh, uh, way back from Adam and uh, Luke also shows Jesus as a man of intelligence he was a man of intelligence and then we see John records as the son of God like the eagle son of God who came to this earth to be the son of man so he was 100% God and 100% man and even uh, John as he starts the gospel he says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and uh, later go as we uh, come down to verse 14 we see how the word became flesh and dwelt among us he portrays Christ there as the son of God so this is what we learn from this, uh, where the very pictures that throughout the Bible, God connects this and he connects it with Jesus, that he had Jesus in his mind. The redemption plan was very much present there itself. With this, we will move on to the next one, the Nazarite vow. What is the Nazarite vow? Anyone in the class can share. Ma'am, I guess uh, they won't shave their hair. hair head. Yes. Yes. So uh, we see in, in uh, chapter 5 to 10, then talks about the sanctification of Israel, uh, sanctification of Israel, and we see different vows. And here we talk about the Nazarite vow. It is a voluntary vow. It is taken by people. And Nazarite vow uh, usually has a beginning and an end, uh, beginning and an end. And we have three people in the Bible who had uh, taken up this vow. First one was Samuel, and second one was Samson, and the third person is John the Baptist in the New Testament and there were few guidelines in this vow uh, that is uh, yes as you said they would not cut the uh, length of the hair uh, as per the uh, the during that uh, vow period and then uh, sorry about that Actually, keep my mobile in silent mode. Okay, they will not cut the hair. And the second is they do not uh, take up any fermented drink or even the grape juice they will not drink. Even a grape seed or even the skin of a grape they will not consume. And the third part, the guideline, the third guideline in this vow was even if uh, any of the family member dies, immediate family member or anyone dies, uh, they cannot attend the funeral of that person. They should not go near the dead body of any person. OK, so this was uh, the three guidelines of this vow and uh, Mm, although the Nazarite vow in the Old Testament, uh, it is an Old Testament uh, concept, but then in the New Testament, we see that um, Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 to 2. Can one of us please turn to Romans chapter 12, verse 1 to 2 and read? Romans chapter 12, verse 1 to 2. 
therefore i urge you brothers in view of god's mercy to offer your bodies as living sacrifices holy and pleasing to god this is your spiritual act of worship do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind then you will be able to test and approve what god's will is his good pleasing and perfect will amen so what we see is good pleasing and perfect will for the christians the ancient nazarite vow symbolizes the need to be separated from from this world but a holy people are been consecrated we have been consecrated in god this is what we are and then we'll go to the next point what is the next point the priestly blessing which has been given it's been recorded in uh, uh, numbers chapter 6 verse 22 to 27 can one of us read the lord said to moses tell aaron and his sons this is how you are to bless the israelites say to them the lord bless you and keep you the lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you the lord turn his face toward you and give you peace so they will put my name on the israelites and i will bless them so this was the priestly blessing given by the lord to us to moses to tell aaron and his sons well with this we will move on to chapter 10 with the cloud of god's presence lives from the tabernacle and guides israel away from mount sinai into the wilderness and immediately things turn out not in a good way and here we see in chapter 13 we'll move on to chapter 13 the report of the 12 spies what happened in chapter 13 can we turn to chapter 13 yes god tells moses to send out the 12 spies one from each tribe so they can go and scout the promised land so when the spies all returned 10 of them came back saying uh, the negative of like how uh, the canaanites were how big they were like they were giants we huge people we cannot uh, face them they will destroy us but there were two people two spies who came back who are the two people Caleb and Joshua who said God can save God can save us and the 10 people you know they spread rumors among the people they spread the fear what they saw the, they didn't see any fear but they just saw the <clears throat> how canaanites were and they had this fear within them and they spread that fear among the israelites they didn't even had to go fight against them but even before they could face the canaanites they were defeated in their mind the just by the very look of those canaanites people sometimes even we even before we could uh, head into any challenges or anything the minute we have our own imagination and the very fear of it uh, makes us be defeated in that area but then god is asking us to be positive to look at how big our god is not at the situation not at the people not at the circumstances but look at how big god is what was the difference between the 10 spies and the two they looked at the canaanites the 10 people the 10 spies looked at the canaanites and their strength to caleb and joshua they didn't look at their weakness but they looked at the mighty strength of god the mighty power of god they remember how god saved them how god supernaturally brought them from the egypt a god who can uh, separate the red sea god who can provide them supernaturally uh, through manna and uh, through quail god can do this 
so they trusted on the god of israel they trusted on the god who was dwelling in them so that made them to be positive but then as these uh, 10 people spread rumors uh, uh, brought fear into them and these uh, people started creating a riot against moses so they started um, you know uh, murmuring and they started asking we want a new leader to go back to egypt and this caused god to be very much angry on these people and we see how moses intercedes on behalf of this people to god as a leader you and i we need to be always mindful of people we need to intercede for others for our city for our church for our nation for our country for the world and when we intercede moses intercedes and god listens to moses because moses reminds god of the promise that he has he had with the servant abraham then god uh, you know uh, he, uh, he hears moses prayer and he answers him by not killing those people but he says uh, not one of them will enter the promised land and that's the reason we see the second time the census was taken to make sure that none of them will enter the promised land and with this as people were uh, you know they were thirsty and they were asking for water so god tells uh, god instructs moses to speak to the rock to get water because uh, people were again and again uh, the israelites were again and again murmuring so uh, moses is uh, moses gets so very upset and he hits the rock twice because uh, uh, Moses hit the rock and didn't speak to the rock you know Moses also dis dishonored God by putting himself in place of God as a one who brings out the water so Moses brings down on himself the same fate as the people in the wilderness did so even he too will not enter the promised land but then even he will die in the desert so with this we will move on to chapter 21 but before we move on to chapter 21 uh, in the verses we see uh, chapter 20 we see the death of Miriam in verse 1 and in the same chapter on 29 we see the death of Aaron and in uh, uh, and in 21 we'll see what happened numbers 21 let's turn to numbers 21 talks about the bronze serpent from verse 4 to 8 we can read can one of us please read or uh, due to time i will just explain this that's okay because we have very few minutes left okay so the Israelites uh, start uh, rebelling again and uh, God brings a very strange judgment on them we see the snakes come out and bite the people so again we see Moses interceding on their behalf but before that I wanted to know where was the snakes all these days they were there in the wilderness from where did the snakes come from one thing we should know that always there's snakes in the wilderness but then it was God's grace that protected them from every danger when the Israelites murmured the grace departed so when we don't have God's edge around us enemy can easily come and attack us same thing that happened they were attacked by the enemies we all need the presence of God we cannot murmur go against God and expect God to protect us
murmuring dishonors God, the very act. And we see how Moses intercedes on the behalf of the people and God tells Moses <clears throat> to take up a bronze snake and lift it up on the pole so that whoever looks at the snake would be healed of this poisonous snake bite. The image of the bronze snake that is lifted up on the pole is to provide the physical healing we see in chapter 21. And this also prefigures the lifting up of Christ on the cross. And now it is the ministry of the word that whoever looks to him by faith shall have the spiritual healing. We have the word of God with us and we need to lift the word of God high because he is dwelling with us in the form of word. And by faith, we will have a spiritual healing and we will be restored back to God. Now, uh, in Numbers 22, we see the talking donkey of Balaam. We know what happened. Uh, the angel of the Lord blocked the way. Where, uh, when Balaam was trying to go on a donkey and he strikes the donkey three times and the angel of the Lord opens the donkey's mouth and it makes uh, the donkey to speak to Balaam. The story goes, if you read chapter 22, 23, 24 and 25, we see here the people, uh, uh, the Israelites were headed on the plain of Moab. So each time when the Israelites were moving, they were moving according to the tribe and they were carrying their flag as their banner. Okay. So the first main part of <clears throat> we see here is uh, uh, the king of Moab, Balak, has been frightened at this huge group of people traveling through his territory. So he hires a pagan sorcerer, Balaam, to pronounce a curse over Israel. But before he could come on the way itself, he encounters the angel of the Lord and he's been warned. And he has to do what the angel of the Lord tells him to do. And uh, here we see Balak hired Balaam to curse the Israel three times. And, <clears throat> and Balaam finds that he is unable to curse them. He can, uh, he can only utter blessing on Israel. Remember God's promise to Abraham in Genesis 12. So not only, uh, not on, uh, uh, like, you know, uh, the blessing of Abraham says that I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. So Balaam is not able to curse Israel. But God actually gives him a vision about, uh, you know, God uh, open up uh, Balaam and gives him a vision and he says the future Israelite king who will one day bring God's justice to all the nation. And this vision recalls Jacob's uh, promise of Judah. Uh, we see in Genesis 49 where it says, and also in number 24, chapter 24, verse 17, it says, I will see him, but not now. I will behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel and batter the brow of Moab and destroy all the sons of Tumid. A scepter will rise out of Israel. Here we see the prophecy of Christ who is called as the morning star. We also see that in the Revelation chapter 22. 2 verse 16, I guess, yeah. For his glory, the brightness, the splendor, for the light that comes through him. And here we also see that he's been called the scepter, the scepter bearer because of his royalty. He not only has the name of a king, but has a kingdom and rules with scepter of grace, mercy, and righteousness. With this, we will move on to the next chapter. In, verse, uh, in chapter 27, we see Joshua's appointment as a leader. We see how God appoints Joshua as a leader. Can one of us turn to Numbers 27, 18 to 23? I'll read now. Yes, please. 
So the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua, son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay your hand on him. Have him stand before Eliezer, the priest, and the entire assembly, and commission him in their presence. Give him some of your authority, so the whole Israelite community will obey him. He is to stand before Eliezer, the priest, who will obtain decisions for him by inquiring of the Urim before the Lord. At his command, he and the entire community of the Israelites will go out, and at his command, they will come in. Moses did as the Lord commanded him. He took Joshua and had him stand before Eliezer, the priest, and the whole assembly. Then he laid his hands on him and commissioned him as the Lord instructed through Moses. You see the rise of the leader, the next leader. God has everything well planned. Well planned. We see how the children of Israel, uh, they uh, through his leadership, they start beginning to prepare to inherit the promised land. And they take the census here to make sure that none of the uh, older generation will enter. So this will be the complete new generation under the new leadership of Joshua. Then they go on <clears throat> under the leadership of Joshua. They go on with uh, fighting few battles and uh, God giving them the victory. Even before they could enter the promised land and settle there. So with this, we also see uh, the end of this new uh, end of this book. We see the new generation ready to enter the promised land, and Moses is about to deliver his final words and blessings. Along with that, he also gives them some, uh, you know, the blessings and warnings, uh, what needs to be done by his wisdom through which he led all these years. So what did we learn through this book? What did we learn? What did the book of numbers teach us? Anyone, just one one point each, one point will do. Um, we learned that God is so organized and He's a great planner that uh, He already planned about the cross even before in the Old Testament. So that's what I learned. Yes, yes, thank you. Anyone else? We, we also learned that God has everything in plan when he's taking we can't hear you your voice is very low i'm saying are you hearing me now yes yes please yeah i'm saying that god has everything in plan as he he can never leave his children desperate when he's taking one leader he has another leader in line for for his group of people amen yes thank you anyone else Yeah. yeah, we see God is organizing his people, the new generation, to enter and settle into the promised land. He's trying to organize them, give them a new leader, give them new directions, and so forth, so on, so as to be able to settle into the promised land. Thank you. Yes, yes. So yes, we see that God has been an holy God, and He expects that holiness from each of us. And yes, as a human, we always fall short. But then through Jesus Christ, we have been made perfect. We have been made holy. We have been made righteous. We see that here. And we also see the sin and unbelief and the uh, rebellion attitude in people time and again. But we see uh, God's grace, faithfulness, despite all that he's been the provider, he's been the protector. 
even now when we go astray, we see that we have been made perfect, we have been forgiven in and through Jesus. Times when we rebel due to sin and belief, we have been we have, we have reaped the judgment of God, but then it's only through Jesus when we repent and ask God for forgiveness, we have been united back to Christ, we're united back to God. We have been restored in that relationship to develop a fellowship with Him. And we see, uh, you know, time and again, this wilderness story has been repeated, retold again and again in the Bible, just to uh, uh, remind us, to be a, set a reminder, like how people can sin and rebel against God, and they will be set for the judgment of God. But then when they ask for forgiveness, they have been restored back. So time and again, this has been reminded throughout the scriptures. We see many prophets and even the poets like the psalmist been recorded. And even in the New Testament, it's been recorded by our apostles. And these stories always serve us as a warning that God will remain, uh, you know, a uh, warning that while God will remain faithful to his covenant promise, and we need to live a life that is pleasing to God. We need to keep that in our mind as we move further. So with this, we will end our session with a word of prayer. Can we pray? Dear God, you are our God, you are our Lord, you are our Master, you are a Lion of Judah, you are the Son of Man. You have given us the strength to serve you as like an untiring ox. You have given us the anointing to foresee things in the prophetic realm, like of an eagle. Thank you that you are dwelling in us, Lord. Thank you that you have chosen us as the living tabernacle. The New Testament says that you are the body of Christ, the temple of the Holy Spirit. Father, I lift each one of us who are in the class and who will also be watching this video later. Lord, we pray and we surrender ourselves. We consecrate ourselves unto you. We pray that you will forgive us our sins completely and you paid the price on the cross. And we have been restored back to you, Lord. Thank you for, the, uh, thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross, who restored us back to you. Thank you that you have made us, you have chosen each one of us to set apart for your holy calling. Lord, I pray that you will give us the heart, the wisdom to serve you the way Jesus served, with all humility, with all intelligence, untiringly. Spirit of the Lord, I pray that you will move in each one of us. You will increase us in your word, in your wisdom and in your spirit. Help each one of us, Lord, to be rooted and grounded in your word so that we may live a life that is holy and pleasing unto you. Thank you, Lord, for doing it so. Thank you that every promise of yours, every covenant of yours will be fulfilled in and through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Today I leave you all with these two reflection questions. Please take a take a note. If you were one of the twelve spies sent to the land of Cana to determine the strength of the enemy, what report would you have brought back? Would it be a response of faith or unbelief? And the second one here is, however powerful the enemy may be, we need to remember that God is more powerful and his promises will come to pass. So what type of giant or the problem we are facing today? The second question is, will you trust God in that situation? Just answer this for yourself. Let's reflect on what we studied today and on the word on the book of Numbers. Okay, thank you so much for joining in today's session. I hope today's session brought a lot of new insights for each of us.
Did it? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma yes, ma Thank you. There's much more to be covered. I would encourage you all to please go through this book chapter by chapter so that we will learn together as we journey on this Old Testament. Okay. Thank you. God bless. See you all tomorrow on Minister's Foundation. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you.